Welcome everybody to another episode of If You Love This Planet. This week on the show, instead of our regular in-depth interviews, we're going to hear a speech given by Dr. Helen Caldicott to residents of Hanover in New Hampshire in the United States. The speech took place on the 31st of March 2011, just three weeks after the earthquake and tsunami that hit Japan, devastating their Fukushima nuclear power plant. Well, I thank Mary very particularly in getting me here. She wrote to me months ago, and I'm staying with my son in Newton with my two grandchildren, and I had some time, so I said, okay, I'll come up here. And I had a dear friend called Betty Tuttle, who used to live here, who um, died. I don't know if you knew Betty. Yeah. yeah, she worked with me, and I kind of changed her life, she said. Um, she was an absolute darling, and, and uh, so she always loved this place because there were so many fascinating lectures, and it was just near Dartmouth and very stimulating. And so I was very pleased to be invited to come here. And Mary said there are a lot of very intellectual people here, so I thought that's a good idea. <laughs> now I'm reading a very interesting book at the moment. Um, it's called Radioactivity, Marie and Pierre Curie. A Tale of Love and Fallout, it's this book. And I'm, I'm only just getting into it, but last night in bed I was reading this, which I found absolutely fascinating. Electricity, radio, the telegraph, the x-ray, and now radioactivity at the turn of the 20th century. A series of invisible forces were radically transforming daily life. These advances were dazzling and disorienting. They blurred the boundary between science and magic. If invisible light could pass through flesh and expose the human skeleton, was it so fantastical to believe in levitation? In telekinesis, in communication with the dead, beginning in the mid-19th century, the spiritualist movement seduced millions, promising contact with the divine through ghosts and spirits. Now spiritualists embrace photography to lend scientific imprimatur to their beliefs, aiming like Ronchin and Beckerel to capture in an image what could not be seen with the naked eye. Um, let me see. Spiritualists claim that clairvoyance possessed X gazes and that photographic plates placed on the forehead could record vital forces of the brain or V rays. Spiritualism penetrated Western culture low and high. Psychic detective Sir Bumnatol, the Napoleon of the Im 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 Immaterial, was a hero of a series of anonymously written novels. Well, I could, I could go on, but if spiritualism and claims proved to be true, Pierre Curie wrote, there was nothing more important from a scientific point of view. He analysed data from a seance as he would have in a laboratory experiment. He measured the ionisation of the air. He weighed Palladine herself. Finding that the medium gained six kilos in the course of a session. She was a, she was a um, medium. He wrote a friend, These phenomena that we have seen to us explicable by any trickery, tables rising from four legs, my grandmother was into this, transport of faraway objects, hands that pinch and caress you, luminous apparitions, every, everything in a place was prepared by us with participants we know well and there could be no possible deception. So it was absolutely fascinating. Um, radiation was kind of spiritual. Anyway, um, Madame Curie worked with radium, as you know, as did Pierre, and they both died quite soon of exposure to radiation, as did her daughter. She died of leukaemia. So we know right from the beginning that radiation induces death and cancer. Um, in the olden days, um, radiologists used to put their hands through the beam to sort of measure the strength of the beam to make sure that it was right for the patients. Many of them died of cancer. Then we got the data from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, the Hibakusha were examined by the American Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission, and there was a peak of leukemia at five years, and cancer started appearing 15 years later and is still increasing amongst those survivors of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs. From this data, we have derived all the exposure that we use for our patients, although it's changed radically over time. 
Uh, the Atomic Bomb Casualty Commission incidentally did not treat the patients. They had no insurance. They were shunned by society because their children may be born abnormally. I remember reading about a doctor who used to shave himself in the morning and if he started bleeding he was terrified that he would have leukaemia. So we have huge amounts of data and yesterday, I don't know if you watched Democracy Now! or listened to it, Amy Goodman, but they, she, Amy put me on, I, I turned Amy on when she was 18 to this subject. Her parents brought her along to hear me at St Mary's East Islip Church in Long Island. Um, she put me on with George Mombio. Do you know, oh, hands up those who know of George Mombio. He's a journalist from the, for The Guardian and he's been terrific on global warming. But now he's suddenly done a U-turn and he's totally pro-nuclear power in the light of what's happening in Fukushima. And um, he accused me of being similar to the climate change deniers who cherry-pick certain scientific papers. I was very um, offended and uh, then he cited a UN document which said only 35 people died at Chernobyl and I thought, my God, you're on the wrong side. Now, I'm going to go into all of this. It was a pretty dynamic debate, as you can imagine, and I ended up at the end with my head in my hands saying, George, have you ever helped a child die of leukaemia? Because I'm a paediatrician. So that's all I really care about. I'm a doctor who took the Hippocratic Oath. So I speak only as a medical doctor. So I've been on to this, I don't know. I read On the Beach when I was a girl. Um, hands up those who saw the film with Alva Gardner and Fred Astaire or read the book. Okay, it's about a nuclear war that occurs by accident. Everyone in the world dies except people in Melbourne, Australia, which is where I lived. And gradually the radiation came down to Melbourne. The government dispensed cyanide capsules so people could kill their babies like that and they wouldn't have to die of the horrendous effects of radiation illness, vomiting and bleeding to death. And at the end of the book, the beautiful, elegant streets of Melbourne were still there with bits of paper blowing down in the breeze and a blind gently flapping, and that was the end of life on Earth. At that time, um, America and Russia didn't have enough bombs to end life on Earth, but soon after, they got them. Then I entered medical school age 17 and learned about um, an experiment by a man called Muller, who irradiated Drosophila fruit fly, and he irradiated them, and as you can follow many generations in, in one year, they developed genes for crooked wings and aberrant eye colour and the like, and they were transferred generation to generation. And at that time, Linus Pauling et al. were saying that children could get leukemia and cancer from the fallout because Russia and America were going hell for leather blowing up bombs in the atmosphere. And for the life of me, as a young, idealistic, altruistic medical student, I couldn't understand what these fellows were up to. And you know what? I still can't. And I would say now, having looked at this for 40 years, they had a case of an acute nuclear psychosis. They're fascinated with E equals MC squared, the power of the atom, the energy inside the centre of the sun, and I think it's got something to do with their limbic system. I've been reading a lot about neuroanatomy lately and neurophysiology, but the two main elements or emotions that stimulate dopamine release in the male limbic system in the midbrain are sex and violence. And you know what it feels like when you've had an orgasm. That's a release of dopamine, morphine-like derivative. So I want to look, the cause or the etiology of the problem facing the world today is not the number of bombs and the number of cancers, which we get obsessed with. It, the cause is these men's brains and how they operate. And I'm getting very fed up with them. I'm sick of it. How long do you have to try and educate people? How long do we have to have people telling lies about science? If I told lies in medicine, I would be dis disqualified immediately. You can't lie in medicine. You can't lie in science. And that's why I actually think that freedom of speech when it comes to Rush Limbaugh, and who's that other awful man, Beck, <laughs> is inappropriate because they're lying about science and they're convincing a whole swathe of people that global warming is not occurring and all the rest of it. Now that's really wicked because it is occurring and our children and grandchildren will have no future. All right, now I have to talk about nuclear power because we've got Fukushima. The Japanese built six reactors designed by GE Mark I reactors 
on an earthquake fault. And these reactors are dangerous. The three men who designed them, Bryden, Mark Hubbard and Miner, who are close friends of mine, resigned knowing these reactors were dangerous and the containment wasn't adequate. So the Japanese built these reactors and they've been operating 30 to 40 years. So there's a hell of a lot of radiation there and you'd be a waste. They say that they uh, designed the reactors to withstand earthquakes, but what happened? Well, the reactors actually did withstand the earthquake, but it was the, the tsunami that came in that just devastated the whole thing. Now, each nuclear reactor uses one million gallons a minute of water to keep it cool. And that, those pumps that keep the water circulating have to be operated by an external electricity supply. So what happened with the earthquake was millions of people lost their external electricity and so did the reactors. So the pumps ceased. However, there's always emergency diesel generators to start the pumps again if they lose the electricity. Guess what? The tsunami drowned them. Then they brought in batteries to get the pumps going, which last eight hours. Suffice it to say, the whole thing failed and the reactors heated up. Now, I, I'm not going to go through the whole nuclear fuel chain from uranium mining. We've got 40% of the world's richest uranium in Australia, and by God, are we going to dig it out as if there's no tomorrow? Well, it's about the economy, isn't it? We all have to have two swimming pools and six cars, and <laughs> it's obscene. I'm very sick of politicians who are in the hands and the pockets of the corporations who pay for them and bribe them and politicians who are scientifically and medically illiterate. This is totally inappropriate in this day and age when the misapplication of science has been so extreme and kids like you, how old are you? 21. This beautiful boy <laughs> won't have a future if we let these characters get away with it. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll teach you how radiation causes cancer and genetic abnormalities. And I learned this in medical school. It's basic. Now there are x-rays and we've all been irradiated by the doctors. We are the biggest irradiators of the public at the moment. The medical profession do never, well you're older now. It's, my daughter said I had two CAT scans the other day and got a hell of a dose of radiation. She's a doctor and I was really upset. And she said, Mum, you're not going to live long enough to get your cancer. That made me feel a lot better. <laughs> you know, daughters. But the incubation time for cancer is any time from 5 to 60 years. Whereas for a cold, it's two days. And for whooping cough, measles, chicken pox, and the like, it's three weeks. Cancer is a long, latent, silent period. And when the cancer develops, how do we know it's from Hiroshima and Nagasaki and lots of other papers? Remember the women who used to paint the watch dials with radium and rich paint? and they used to lick the paintbrushes and swallowed the radium um, to make the figures nice and accurate. Radium is a bone seeker. It goes, it's a calcium analogue. It goes to bone. Many of those women died of leukaemia or cancer of the maxilla or mandible. So we know what these things do. Okay, so x-rays. All radiation is dangerous. No radiation is safe. Background radiation probably induces... 30% of the cancers we see now, the Egyptian mummies had cancer. And now we live in a chemical cocktail of 80,000 chemicals in common use, and they act synergistically with the radiation. Never have an x-ray unless it's indicated. Do not have your teeth x-rayed every year. My ex-husband was a radiologist. They make a lot of money. Don't walk through those x-ray machines at the airport. I don't care if they examine all my cavities. I'm not going to walk through an x-ray machine. Fetuses are going through it. One x-ray to the pregnant abdomen doubles the incidence of leukemia in that baby. Babies are terribly sensitive to radiation. Older people are too. Immunocompromised patients are sensitive to getting cancer from radiation. Radiation is cumulative. Each dose you receive adds to your risk of getting cancer. Then there's gamma radiation given off by radioactive materials made in reactors. Then there's alpha radiation, which is particulate, composed of two protons and two neutrons, emitted from an unstable atom, and that's uranium, it's plutonium, and it's deadly. 
And what the industry does, two protons and two neutrons, you might inhale a millionth of a gram of plutonium in your lung, which is carcinogenic. And it deposits right here, right at the periphery of the lung. And because the alpha particle travels a very short distance, the surrounding cells get a whopping dose. And as radiation decreases with the square of the distance on the periphery, some cells survive, most die. And those cells that survive, probably their regulatory gene in their nucleus is damaged, which controls the rate of cell division. And the gene, the DNA molecule, is biochemically damaged and the cell sits for five to 60 years. And one day, instead of dividing into two, it goes crazy and produces trillions of cells. So it takes a single alpha particle to hit a single gene in a single cell to kill you. So what does the nuclear industry do? It averages that dose of radiation, which is lethal to those cells, over the whole lung fields. That's lying. They don't understand radiation biology, or if they do, they're covering up. And then you hear in Japan, oh, it's only low dose radiation. Oh, yeah? If you get a microgram of plutonium in your lung, almost certainly you'll get cancer. And that could also cause lymphoma, this is going to the lymph glands in the chest, liver cancer to the liver, bone cancer and leukemia because it goes to the, it's, the body thinks plutonium is iron, so it's used to make hemoglobin. So it can make leukemia, white blood cell cancer, or by radiating bone cells, bone cancer. It crosses the placenta, damaging a normally, genetically normal embryo, like thalidomide. Remember thalidomide, when babies were born, maybe some of you took it during pregnancy. Babies were born with no limbs or terrible deformities. That's called teratogenesis, damage of a normal embryo, by plutonium. And plutonium has a predilection for testicles, it tends to deposit next to the spermatogonia where it can irradiate the genes in coming generations. We all carry several hundred genes for disease like cystic fibrosis, diabetes, and many others. And we pass those genes on generation to generation. Meanwhile, as plutonium has a half-life of 24,400 years, and it lives for half a million years, if the man's cremated, which is contraindicated now because it adds to global warming, I'm going to be buried in a cardboard coffin to feed the worms back to the earth. Um, anyway, the plutonium escapes and another man can breathe it in and it will get into his testicles. So you can see what will get random compulsory uh, genetic engineering really for the rest of the time, just from the plutonium and I'm going to talk about other things. An exponential increase in genetic disease. Now, radiation caused evolution. It, it produced fish that develop lungs, birds that develop wings, and we evolved this magnificent species with an opposing thumb, brilliant neocortex, and we can do anything. I happen to think we're an evolutionary aberrant. We are destroying the earth. We are destroying the earth. And it's happened in our generation. And we've let it happen. And then we give it to our children and grandchildren and say, well, now it's your problem. We'll be dead soon, and we will our problem, and we did it. So anyway, that's plutonium. I'll get into that in a minute. So that's an alpha particle. Beta particle is an electron, and it does the same thing. All of these things mutate genes, either in the eggs and sperm, and there are now 2,600 genetic diseases described. That's a hell of a lot. So that's how radiation causes cancer, and it's cumulative. No dose is safe. No dose is safe. Okay, now, I'm not going to go through the whole nuclear fuel chain. Those who are interested, this is my book that I wrote, Nuclear Power is Not the Answer, not long ago. And it goes through the whole uranium mining, uranium milling, uh, uranium enrichment, nuclear power, decommission of reactors, nuclear waste, nuclear weapons and nuclear war. It's a really pleasant, happy book to read. And you won't enter any depression if you read it. But I advise you to read it. It's like I had to learn Grey's Anatomy to become a doctor. You are all, even though you're older, 
physicians to a dying planet that is in the intensive care unit. And you've got a lot of energy and time, many of you, right? Don't you? You could turn this country upside down if you decided. Imagine all of these raging grannies and grandfathers going to Congress and doing things that attract the media. You know that nuclear power produces no global warming, don't you? You know it's clean, green and sustainable. Well, guess what? How do you mine uranium? Millions of tons of it. How do you dig it up? What do you use? You tell me. Come on. All those steam shovels and stuff? Trucks? Oil. Fossil fuel. What does oil do when it's flat? Oh, it makes carbon dioxide. Oh, huge amounts of CO2 are produced. Then they crush the ore into very fine powder, more CO2. Then they turn the uranium into a gas called uranium hexafluoride and send it to Paducah, Kentucky. And the process of enrichment, and I won't go into it tonight, is so energy consuming it takes two huge coal-fired plants in Paducah to enrich the uranium for use in nuclear power. Oh, but don't you know, nuclear power is clean, green and sustainable. These people lie unbelievably. When I debated with generals about nuclear war, you know, they can't really lie because they know that a bomb dropping on a city will vaporise most of the inhabitants. Like, there are 40 hydrogen bombs targeted on New York as I speak, and yet little Dick Cheney worried about terrorists. <laughs> Who are the real terrorists? Of the 23,000 bombs in the world today, America and Russia own 97% of them. Who are the real rogue nations holding the world at nuclear ransom? Who's the axis of evil? Russia and America. And it's all about male prestige. And it's the same in Pakistan and India. Nuclear weapons are a symbol of male prestige. And the women are pathetic. We just stand behind them and let them do what they want to do. And if it continues, there will be no world left anymore. It may happen in our lifetimes, and it may not. Okay, now when you put uranium in a nuclear power plant, you put 100 tonnes of uranium in. 100 tonnes. And there are boron moderating rods that moderate the flux of neutrons. And as they're lifted out, the whole thing's submerged in water. You get the energy of E equals mc squared. When you split the atom, the energy equals the mass of the atom times the speed of light squared. Which Einstein suddenly got when he was watching a tram go by. So science is very intuitive. And tremendous heat is produced. And the heat boils the water. And the steam is taken off, which turns a turbine, which generates electricity. So all a nuclear power plant is designed to do is to boil water. It's like cutting a pound of butter with a chainsaw. As Einstein said, nuclear power is a hell of a way to boil water. Why did they develop it? Because I knew a lot of the blokes. You know what a bloke is? An Australian for a guy. Blokes. I knew a lot of them who were in the Manhattan Project, who were so guilt-stricken by killing 200,000 people and vaporising most of them, that they thought they could harness atoms for peace and that they could die relatively with less guilt. But they all died feeling terribly guilty because they knew the dangers. When you fish in uranium, 200 new elements are formed, all of which are man-made. Some last seconds and some last millions of years. The uranium becomes one billion times more radioactive when it's fissioned, one billion times. And each reactor contains the equivalent of radiation as a, of a thousand Hiroshima-sized bombs, long-lived radiation. You've got 103 of them around your country. The reactor uses a million gallons a minute to keep cool, and that's what happened at, at uh, Fukushima, it lost the cooling. Um, now, every year they remove 30 tonnes of spent fuel rods, it's 100 tonnes of uranium in the reactor, because they're so polluted with fission products, they're inefficient. And that's radioactive waste. Now, in Fukushima and on many of your reactors, they've got cooling pools on the roofs of the reactor, and they call them swimming pools. And they're protected by a tin roof. They're not in the containment vessel. And they can have two to 30 times more radiation than in the nuclear reactor itself. And that's probably true for Vermont Yankee.
probably 30 tons. The reactors at, at Japan are 30 to 40 years old, whereas when Chernobyl melted down, it was only three months old. And the, there's a very interesting thing called the bathtub curve, and it applies to humans and nuclear power plants. So, in the first few months and years of life, an infant is vulnerable to getting meningitis and rubella and, and uh, whooping cough and the like. And then in the mid-years, people are relatively stable. And then as they start getting older, they become more unstable. Their pipes get crusty. I've got a very big aortic atherosclerotic plaque and I could have a stroke any day. And we all, we start falling apart. Same with reactors. They're most vulnerable in their early years and Three Mile Island and Chernobyl are only three months old. And then as they get older, they get very rusty, their pipes start falling apart from the intense radiation, embrittlement of the pipes and the like. And in America, because it costs a hell of a lot to build a reactor, it's better to keep them running so the utilities can make lots of money. So they're extending the lifespan from 40 to sometimes 80 years, which is terribly dangerous. I predict that Fukushima will mean the end of nuclear power in the world. That accident, I'll go into it in a minute, has only just started. So that's the bathtub curve. So they take out 30 tonnes of radiation every day, and these swimming pools, they put the fuel rods on racks. A fuel rod is 12 feet long and half an inch thick. It gives off such gamma radiation but if you stand next to it for a couple of seconds, you'll die within two weeks with your hair falling out, vomiting and bleeding to death. Because the gamma radiation kills the actively dividing cells of the body, which is why we use radiation to treat cancer, hoping to kill those very rapidly proliferating cells while the body survives. It works sometimes, it works particularly well in children, but often those children whose tumours and leukaemias are cured go on 20 years later to get a second primary cancer from the radiation that has damaged normal cells. And we've seen that more and more. So they racked up these pools and made them very full. So they too could reach actually critical mass and have a meltdown. Now, in some of the pools at Fukushima, they lost their cooling water too. And the rods are covered with zirconium which is a reactive metal that when it's exposed to air, it burns spontaneously. And then you get a meltdown in the cooling pool. In this book, I describe a meltdown in the cooling pool, a study from Princeton, and it's much, much, much worse than a meltdown in a reactor. Okay, so in, in Japan, they, they lost all their radiation measurement equipment from the tsunami. And you see men running around with Geiger counters. And they're saying they're testing the thyroids of children because thyroids suck up radioactive iodine and causes cancer. And they say the doses are too low. No, because they're internal emitters. The iodine gets into the thyroid gland and the cells in the gland get high doses which you cannot measure with a Geiger counter. Like plutonium, you can't measure plutonium in the body unless you put a patient in a whole body counter. So it's internal emitters that get inside you that do the damage. External radiation, yeah, it can be dangerous, but not like these things that come out of reactors. And all of these elements go to various organs in the body, and they bioconcentrate in the food chain. For instance, at Fukushima, the radioactive iodine in the sea now has gone up, what is it, 3,300 times above normal limits. There's no normal limit for radioactive iodine because it's man-made. Now what happens is that as the iodine gets into the seawater, it bioconcentrates in the algae by orders of magnitude, then in the, then in the crustaceans, then in the little fish, then in the big fish, and then in us, because we're highest on the food chain. Bioconcentration. So I rang a man in Melbourne, Australia, who tests the food coming in from Europe. Because 40% of Europe is now radioactive and will remain so for hundreds of years. So some batches of food are radioactive and some are not. And I said to him, well, what do you do when you find radioactive food? And he said, oh, we dilute it with non-radioactive food. As you just have seen, 
The solution to pollution by dilution when it comes to radiation is fallacious. He didn't know what he was doing. And most people don't, including that Dr. Gupta on CNN, who admits he knows not much about radiation, but is pontificating about it. Radioactive iodine is a beta and a gamma emitter. If it has a half-life of eight days. You multiply half-life by about 10 or 20 to get its normal life. So it lasts for about six weeks. When Three Mile Island melted down, Hershey's Chocolates is 15 miles from Three Mile Island, the richest dairying area in the United States. That's where they get their milk for their chocolates. The milk from the cows was so full of radioactive iodine, so radioactive, they powdered the milk for six weeks and then used it for the chocolates till the iodine decayed. But other stuff got out, like strontium-90 that lasts for 600 years that causes bone cancer and leukaemia. Cesium-137 that lasts for 600 years, causing brain cancer, muscle cancer, ovarian cancer, plutonium, and many other things. They say no one died. No one has done a proper epidemiological study of the people living around Three Mile Island. But the vets knew. I went to Three Mile Island, Harrisburg, a week after the accident, and I spoke to a huge gymnasium full of the most frightened people. And a vet came up to me and he said, watch the animals. He said, that would be the first to show exposure because their noses are, back, are close to the ground and they inhale the radiation that's landed on the ground. Two-headed cows were born with gross deformities amongst the animals. The plants also were grossly deformed because their genes were mutated by the radiation. People developed radiation sickness. No one died of it, but they got pretty sick, vomiting and erythema and nosebleeds, and there's been a lot of cancer there, but they only followed the people till 1985, six years after the accident. But cancer takes five to 60 years to develop. Then they said, nothing to, no one's died. So the nuclear power industry lies all the time, lies. And the GPU, General Public Utilities, they said, if anyone has had, has an illness like cancer or Down syndrome, which could be created by radiation, or even heart attacks, which have nothing to do with radiation, they paid the people $100,000 to shut up. So there's a huge conspiracy of silence about Three Mile Island. But don't you know, that's a nuclear renaissance, because that is the answer to global warming. Now, strontium-90 is another element I mentioned, which lasts for 600 years. Beta and gamma, and it's calcium analog that goes to bone. And do you remember Linus Pauling, Barry Commoner, saying collecting children's teeth during the years of the testing of Russia and America, and saying children would get leukemia and cancer? I knew Jerry Wiesner, who was Jack Kennedy's science advisor, and Jerry said to me one day, Jack was standing in the Oval Office with his hands behind his back, looking out at the rain on the Oval windows, the office. And he said, you mean, Jerry, there's radiation in that rain? He said, yes, Mr. President. So it was Jack Kennedy who brought about the partial test ban treaty, test bombs underground, but not above ground. So out of sight, out of mind, and America got on building thousands of nuclear weapons to blow up the world. Cesium-137, I've mentioned that, that causes bone ca uh, muscle cancers, brain cancers last 600 years. Now, that's all in radioactive waste and lots and lots more things. Americium, curium, neptunium, that's all in this book. Highly carcinogenic. And at Fukushima, there was a meltdown two days ago in reactor two. The fuel melted its way through the containment vessel and hit the concrete on the floor below. It's possible the fuel will uh, react with the concrete a huge hydrogen bulk will occur in the containment and blow it apart. That's what happened at Chernobyl. There was a hydrogen explosion at Three Mile Island just after Jimmy Carter took Rosalind in the yellow boots. Remember? In the yellow boots and the yellow raincoat. So we, we know what's happening now. The cooling pools have been burning because they've got no, no cooling water. The radiation levels are going up and up and up. There's radiation in the stratosphere and Qantas pilots being told to fly around it. 
planes landing in China and in America from Tokyo. The passengers have radiation on them and it's in their luggage. If there is an explosion and a total meltdown, three things will happen. A, all the workers who are really dead men walking because they're get, getting such high doses, they're going to die. They will have to be evacuated immediately. So no one will be able to be there to stop any more meltdowns in the cooling pools or the reactors themselves. One. Two, a huge cloud of radiation will go up. Now, if the wind's blowing south towards Japan, which is a little island, that will be the end of most of Japan. If it's blowing east from west, you're going to get it. Already, there's radiation in the water in Massachusetts and in Florida, and in many places. So it goes up into the stratosphere and circles the globe and falls down when the rain comes and it's going to rain tonight. And the snow comes. And that's why it's heterogeneous. It's a hot spot there and this part of the field is okay because it didn't rain there. And that's why Europe is 40% is, is radioactive. If, well the Japanese Prime Minister says he sees no end to it. Then it might go on from, I can see no end. Months or years. And when I first read about this, I suddenly got it. Oh my God. This is going to pollute the Northern Hemisphere with radioactive elements getting in the food. And I predict there'll be millions of cases of cancer from this. I also predict it will be the end of the nuclear industry. But too late, she cried. It's kind of like a nuclear war without explosions. It just makes my heart sink. And I was walking in Boston yesterday with my two-year-old grandson, who is just the most divine thing I could eat him. He's so delicious. And I suddenly realized, well, we've got this horrendous thing that's ongoing, set up by men, mankind. But what if it's a nuclear war tonight because the weapons are still on head trigger alert? Clinton left them there. There'll be no one around to write the history. And it will be as dreadful, or more so, than what is happening in Fukushima. Einstein said, the splitting of the atom changed everything, all reality. So man's mode of thinking, thus we drift towards unparalleled catastrophe. And the military, they like their bombs. And in order for Obama to get this new START treaty ratified, Senator Kyle, a wicked man, said, you have to give us $85 billion to build more nuclear weapons. And Obama did. I've lost faith in him, finally. I've been hoping and hoping. He's been captured by the wicked people. He has. Bill more nuclear weapons. What a good idea. And even then, Kyle did not vote for the treaty. These men should be in jail. Because we're talking about, I mean, if we have a nuclear war, that's the end of life on Earth, the final epidemic of the human race. Is that a criminal thing to do? The destruction of the creation, all life on Earth. Is that criminal? Well, if someone murders someone in America, they get put in jail and maybe they go to the electric chair because it's a crime. Your whole country, and I'm really socking it to you, is based on death. You spend a trillion dollars a year on weapons. The Pentagon's run by Lockheed Martin, and Raytheon, and Boeing. They steal your tax dollars for death. It's not the Department of Defense, that's rhubarb. It's the Department of Death. They're into killing. And if we don't stop killing each other, killing each other, we're going to blow up the planet, for sure. And I'm getting very fed up with this. Rumsfeld was a sociopath, if not a psychopath. So is Cheney. Sociopaths, one in 20 people are sociopaths. They're charming, brilliant, but they have no moral conscience. What about Alexander the Great? Why did he become a hero, killing hundreds of thousands of people for Greece? What about Napoleon? What about in Europe, there's a man on a horse in every square, a killer? Why do we glorify war? Why do we glorify killing? What's the matter with us? Why do women stand back and let the men do it? Why did I, when I was 
premenopausal, fall in love with alpha males. I couldn't help it. Is it sociobiology when where we lived in caves, we needed the men to kill the saber-toothed tigers to protect us breastfeeding our babies in the caves? I don't know, but I want to explore it. But I tell you what, if we don't stop this killing ethic, we're done. We're done. And that's not even talking about global warming. Oh, I want to talk about nuclear waste. You've got 70,000 tonnes of high-level radioactive waste and no one knows where to put it. Well, I'm going to put it in the upper mountain in Nevada. Why? Because the meeting to decide whether that would happen, which state would get it. All the other states had two representatives and Nevada only had one of the meetings, so Nevada got it. They wanted to bury it in the upper mountain, transected by 30 earthquake faults, um, made of pumice, and as you know, pumice is very permeable. Um, but Harry Reid comes from Nevada, and he said to Obama, you've got to veto Yucca Mountain. So he did. No one knows where to put the waste. It lasts for half a million years. You tell me a container, container that would last for longer than 100 years. Concrete splits, um, uh, steel rusts, we're going to have leaking radioactive waste for the rest of time, getting to water supplies, bioconcentrating in the breast milk, in the babies, inducing epidemics of genetic disease and cancer for the rest of time. Now, I said that to George Mompio and he thought I was mad. Know why? He's never done medicine. It took me years and years to become a doctor. Right, Tom? We learn a lot, Tom's a fellow paediatrician. And I'm debating with these people who have no idea of science or medicine, and furthermore, they don't want to hear it because they're probably being paid by the nuclear industry who's got millions of dollars. So you can imagine time hence, a woman make, waking up in the morning, the baby being born, maybe deformed, or with a genetic disease, her breast milk is already radioactive, Children getting cancer at six instead of 60 because they've been exposed so early in life. That's the legacy we're leaving, so we can turn our lights on on our computer. Oh, but isn't that our right to have exactly what we want? Leave the lights on all night? I commissioned a study called Carbon Free, Nuclear Free. There's enough alternative energy renewable systems now which are very cheap to supply the whole of America with renewable energy. Why isn't there a solar panel on every house in America? Why isn't there a solar hot water system on every house in America? Why aren't there solar, you know, thermal systems? Windmills everywhere. I don't care if they bug the hell out of people and they're a bit noisy. You know, I don't care. That's so stupid and selfish and egocentric. And they spoil the view. Well, too bad. We're going to destroy the planet. Why is it happening? Because the politicians are in the back pockets of the nuclear industry, the coal industry, the oil industry, you name it, the gas industry. Ah, fed up. This is not a democracy because people aren't using it. They're sitting on their bottoms playing with Facebook thinking that'll fix things. That's not going to fix things. It's a displacement activity. We've got to get out there like the people in Wisconsin. What about Egypt? Take over. The doctors have to leave because we have such authority and credibility. This is the ultimate medical problem. Will the world end with a whimper, the epidemics of disease for the rest of time, or a bang with a nuclear war? Now, I just want to point one thing out. A wonderful study done by the New York Academy of Sciences called Chernobyl. Now, you probably know that the International Atomic Energy Agency and the UN Agency say only 35 people died at Chernobyl. That's a lie. No one's ever studied it from a, 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 an English perspective. But a lot of Russians have, namely Yablokov, Nesterenko, two Nesterenkos. They translated 5,000 papers from Russian into English. Oh, fancy. This is one of the scariest books I've ever read. You can get it from the New York Academy. The estimates are nearly a million people have already died from Chernobyl. Nearly a million. This is the biggest medical conspiracy cover-up I've ever read in the history of medicine. How dare they lie about Chernobyl? There are homes full of the most deformed children. They're like thalidomide babies. No 
violins, you know, they're being born with single eyes and gross deformities. We've never seen this in the history of pediatrics. I think 58,000 people or so have developed thyroid cancer, of whom 23,000 have died so far. Leukemia everywhere, cancers rising in Sweden, in England, in France, in Germany, and Belarus, and I mean, it's just unbelievable. And then they, they thought they'd have a renaissance of this wicked, wicked industry. And then we've got Fukushima. So I advise those who are interested to please read this book and download it. Um, weapons. <laughs> I wrote this book called The New Nuclear Danger, George Bush's Military Industrial Complex. And it's got a picture of George the second, and Cheney and Colin Powell smiling and looking up at the mushroom cloud. It came out just as 9-11 hit. And do you remember the nationalism and the crazy sort of attitude of we've been attacked, you know, they want our way of life, all of that stuff? Friends of mine who support me said, if you publish that cover, I'll never talk to you again. <laughs> anyway, as things calmed down, we got the cover on. But this talks about nuclear weapons. I don't know if you're interested or not, but it goes into the psychology of the weapons makers. When a weapons man designs a bomb, he sleeps alone with the bomb in the desert the night before the explosion. He talks about having labor pains and the need to push. He talks about postnatal depression. So it's comparing annihilation with the creativity of life. Unless we look at the psychology behind this, we're going to do nothing. It's no use just counting bonds. Or money. Money doesn't matter. It's lives that matter. Not just us, but we survive with 30 million other species. The lilacs are about to bloom. In Boston, the crocuses are just coming up. The tulips are breaking the surface of the soil. Isn't that what we love? Or do we not love it? Enough to save it. I wrote a book called If You Love This Planet that you can get about global warming and toxic pollution and overpopulation, you name it. But I talk about that and what the role the media plays. Namely, my fellow colleague Rupert Murdoch. Now, I just want to do the nuclear weapons. So, Russia's got 2,500 hydrogen bombs in silos on hair trigger alert, ready to go. If they launch, they take half an hour to go to New York, to Washington, to here, you've got a university, you'd have a couple trip, um, that are targeted on you. America's got 2,500. They pick the attack up with their satellite and they launch within one hour, the whole thing's over. Cities burning, the whole country will burn coast to coast, north to south. And a huge radioactive black cloud will circle the Earth for years, blocking out the sun, creating a short ice age and a nuclear winter. And everything and everyone will die. That could happen tonight. Obama gets three minutes to make a decision. You know what the football is? If you watch him, always behind him is a military officer with a big suitcase. And that contains the codes to start a nuclear war. No one tells us that. When Reagan was shot, they lost the football for two days. Remember, Alexander Haig said, I'm in charge now? Yeah. Scary man. Now, I'm just going to read with this Yeltsin, who was a hardened alcoholic, like a bottle of vodka before breakfast type of alcoholic. America launched in 1995 a missile containing a weather satellite. They had informed the Kremlin that the Russians lose stuff, and they forgot. They saw this thing going up and they said, oh my God, America's launched a nuclear attack. For the first time ever, in the history of the nuclear age, a football was open. And there's Yeltsin with Korsakoff syndrome and Wernicke's encephalopathy from his alcoholism. And the general standing over his shoulder, he had three minutes. Hmm. And they said, press that button, Mr. President. 30 seconds before that three minutes elapsed, the missile veered off course. And that's why we are sitting here tonight. And we're not radioactive atoms flying around in the stratosphere. Those accidents occur not infrequently. When I wrote that book as a physician, gathering the data, I don't really understand how 
I was still here. With that, I end this diatribe. Thank you. You want to ask some questions, or are you all in a state of shock and disbelief? First stage of grief, huh? Yeah, so you uh, paint a very scary picture appealing to our fears. Uh, no, I'm not appealing to your fears, I'm telling you the truth, like a doctor tells a patient about a diagnosis. So I'm not appealing to your fear at all. You may react with fear, but that's your emotional response to the data. Well, it does create an emotional response. Yeah. I'm just really concerned because I've learned that bananas contain radioactive potassium uh, bananas? Not, yes, bananas. Who taught you that? Uh, I learned that from a, a physics professor. Right, next. Uh, Brazil nuts. Yep. Uh, there's aeromericium in our smoke detectors. Yep. Uh, and that if we decide to live in Colorado, we get a much higher dosage of radiation. I'm just wondering, you know, I'm hearing all these scientists say, say this. Are they in on the conspiracy? Where does this conspiracy end? Well, yeah, bananas contain radioactive potassium. They say sleeping next to your wife, you get a dose of radiation at night. <laughs> yeah, Colorado is high, you get a fair bit of gamma radiation from the sun, cosmic rays. And, and if you live in Maine, where are we? We're in New Hampshire. Yeah. Maine houses have a lot of radon in their basements. That's background radiation, which, as I said, contributes to about 30% of the cancers we already see. More radiation adds to it. And let me talk about americium. I testified before the New York, New York State Fire Department in 1975, and I begged them not to use americium, which is more toxic than plutonium. It's a daughter, decay product of plutonium, more toxic. Because they could use photovoltaic cells. So they went ahead and used waste products from nuclear power, and it's now the law that you have to have americium in your houses and your smoke detectors. It's an alpha emitter. The alpha doesn't get out through the plastic. But if the house burns, it spreads around, or if you know the house is taken apart and it goes to the rubbish dump, the americium leaks into the water. It's very soluble and concentrates in the food. But that's just a little bit. I mean, I, I tried to cover a huge waterfront tonight in a short space of time. I invite you to read the book, and I invite you, I've got my cards. If you disagree, write to me and ask me questions. From your perspective, where is the hope? There's, the hope lies in your heart and soul. I came here as an alien, a woman, and a young doctor in 1978. And everyone I talked to said it's better to be dead than red. Have a nuclear war. I said, well, what about the pygmies in Africa? They'll die too. Yeah, they don't want to be communists. So we start, I got together 23,000 physicians, and we started teaching them about people, about the medical effects of a bomb dropping on Boston that after five miles, everyone is vaporized. After 20 miles, everyone is lethally burnt. And the whole area consumed in the firestorm of 3,000 square miles. And the fires coalesce across America, and people started to say, oh, nuclear war's bad for our health. They did. And the bishop in Boston said, um, I don't think Jesus would like this. <laughs> so the bishops wrote a, a, a a letter, um, what was it called? A something letter about nuclear war. It was very powerful. I spoke to 30,000 Methodist women and they rushed back to their ministers and said, what are we doing about nuclear war? And the ministers didn't know, so up came the Methodist bishop's pastoral letter. I got an invitation to speak at the annual mortician society. And I said, what, what do you want me to speak there? And they said, well, we don't want to have to embalm radioactive bodies. And I said, don't worry, you'll be one yourself. So they passed a resolution against nuclear war. So in five years, from most people supporting nuclear war, 80% opposed it. That was the second American Revolution. And I helped to lead that. Don't tell me you can't be powerful. You can be as powerful as the most powerful person who ever lived. But hope lies in your soul. See, but I didn't give, I can give a much different speech. I can give a speech so that everyone ends up in tears go for people's souls very gently and with humility and they'll follow me off a cliff. You can talk to an audience like you talk to a patient and get through their psychic numbing into their gut. For those who are feeling depressed, that's a totally normal reaction or the Kubler-Ross stages of grief. One is shock and disbelief. I said a couple of wrong things maybe and you'll get a second opinion. 
The next one is depression, which is idiosyncratic. It can last weeks, months, or years. It's important to experience that without taking antidepressants or having a drink. Because as Carl Jung said, the avoidance of legitimate suffering is the cause of all mental illness. And you grow psychologically through suffering. Then you reach the angry stage. And if the anger is focused on the particular outrage that you have when you've learned the truth about that you've got pancreatic cancer and might die in here, anger is a very important emotion. It's a, an emotion of survival. When we're chased by a bull, the adrenaline van secretes adrenaline, the blood pressure goes up, the blood sugar goes up, the heart rate goes up, and we can jump a fence six feet high. Fight or flight. It's appropriate to be angry, but I find that in America people are scared of anger, so they don't show it in appropriate ways. They tend to shoot each other on highways or, you know, get mad with the woman behind the counter in the checkout thing. But if anger is focused, it's totally appropriate and I always think of the Germans. Yeah, well, we saw those trucks on the rails. We didn't know it was in them. Yeah, we saw the smoke coming out of the chimneys. It smelt sort of sweet. We didn't know what it was. The only way evil flourishes is for good people to do nothing. And the Nuremberg Principles established, the Nuremberg Trials for the Nazis, that every person is morally responsible for what their society does. Every single person is morally responsible. That's how Hitler killed six million Jews and gypsies and homosexuals, because they did nothing. So anger, when focused, turns on the soul and the brain. First, you must understand what it's about. As Jefferson said, an informed democracy will behave in a responsible fashion. That was Dr. Helen Caldicott. You're listening to If You Love This Planet. Dr Caldicott was delivering a speech to residents of Hanover in New Hampshire on the 31st of March 2011.